Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Part eight, I believe, of the popular culture series, and we've been moving through this uh, sort of briskly. I hope you got a chance to try the Zen the Art of TV Watching experiment from the section on TV, because I do think it's illustrative of some points that will be uh, amplified. In this one, I want to look at the new media, social media as it's called, but it's really the, the media that came along in the wake of the smartphone revolution. And I cannot emphasize enough how much of a revolution this has been and how quickly uh, smartphones have been adopted. And so we want to look at that and then the implications for these different technologies on how they influence our life, how we view the world, and how we perceive cultural and gen general and ourselves, how we inter interact when, on those fronts. Now, it's important to know that the first smartphone, Apple, introduced by Apple, was introduced in 2007. And so we're just, what, about 16 years from there? They really became broadly available by about 2009. They were super expensive. There are limited plans, et cetera, et cetera. So it's by 2009 and 10 that um, the, the, they start to really promulgate in society. So all of these aspects of contemporary culture, TikTok, um, a lot of Facebook, uh, Instagram, many of these other elements of the smartphone that we now take for granted that are completely ubiquitous, in fact, we're going to run an experiment on that front, have only been around for a little over a decade. And today, the statistics show, give or take, that more people have smartphones and have access to clean water in the world. So for in a, just over a decade, for a technology to go from cell phones existed, but this was really a new implementation of existing technology, that obviously had revolutionary impact and helped Apple become um, pretty much the most valuable company in the world. And it's just completely conquered the globe. And so this is a, a astounding, like astoundingly rapid adoption of a whole bunch of technologies that are all interrelated. And on one hand, I think we, we, it's easy to forget what a miracle these are, how, how many old forms, maps and you know navigation, phones, of course, uh, the way media is consumed, uh, all the new game apps, uh, shopping, communication, text, me like this just has rolled through very rapidly and displaced all kinds of old traditional social forms and interactions and emphasized an entirely new mode, well, not entirely new, but a, an evolution into a new mode of uh, socializing, interaction, uh, use of time. Uh, estimates vary. Again, I'm always dubious of these statistics, but m most people, and particularly the younger you are, the more likely it is to be true, are touching your phone several hundred to thousand times a day. Like this repeated touching, 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 typing and opening and closing and opening and closing. And they have time uh, trackers on your, on your phone. Most phones have these, so you can check and see for yourself how much time you actually are using your, your phone for various purposes, and that can be illustrative. But again, it is, as I keep mentioning with these technologies, they're not neutral. They have all of these sort of impacts. And to me, the astounding thing with the phone for, uh, for that does all kinds of great things, but what I've noticed mostly, and what I really noticed with my students, because I grew up in a generation before these existed, is they're the great distractors. And I always think of this passage, or several passages actually, in 1984 by George Orwell, where he talks about one of the tactics, if not the main tactic, that Big Brother uses to keep control of the masses is to constantly interrupt their thoughts with flashing images, uh, pictures, loud noises, and discontinuous talking, right? So lots of noise, lots of talking, and then constant flashing images. And it turns out that you can't really think clearly when you're in this environment. You can't have an inner life, you can't have an imagination, you can't reason clearly, or it makes it very difficult. It's a huge barrier to that. And so when I think about the phone technology and when I watch people use their phones, uh, it quickly became apparent to me that what happens is people set up their phones to the amount of distraction that they want, right? It's sort of a variable distraction machine. And so people can say, oh, I want to, and so I'm sure everybody's noticed this, anytime you click on a new website or a new podcast or a new anything, 
first thing they ask you is do you want to get notifications because a notification will make your phone make a noise or make it buzz and then this is the way for you to know that you've gotten some new incredibly important piece of information um, and so what people do is they set their phone to buzz or make noise as much as they want to be distracted or entertained or have it draw their attention from other things. And slowly but surely what happens is you get trained up into thinking that these constant buzzes and noises are uh, important themselves. Right, and, the, and, and if you don't have them, you feel like something is wrong, that I'm missing something, that a call may have come in that I missed, or a text message may have come across, or a, a new thing, a new event, or somebody's trying to get a hold of me. And, and so it gives this nagging sense that if you don't get regular updates, or you don't get regular interruptions, it means you're missing something. And so I'd better check. So even if I don't get an interruption or an update, I, I'd better check. And I ran this experiment in class where I'd say, okay, I want everybody not just to put your phones away, but which of course always required in class, but I want you to turn them off. Like literally let's turn the power off. And so everybody go, okay, like this is everybody turn their phones off and put them away. So now they can't actually be disturbed. And the longer we went in class, and I used to teach classes that were two and a half hours long, so we would take a break in the middle. And it's like, okay, so the longer we went, you could see slowly this level of anxiety would also often develop. And even though they knew there was no way for their phones to communicate, they could feel that something must be going in because they're used to getting these constant you know, interruptions. And even if they couldn't answer the phone because they were in class, they at least knew they were coming in. And so you could see this agitation. And then we do this at the beginning of class and we do all kinds of other things to distract people and to think about it and do experiments and we're having big fun and learning things. And then okay, I would say, okay, it's break time. And there would be this just group, like leap for their phones and this in frustration while they waited for the phone to actually power back on, which would take, you know, a minute or something. And then finally, when they, they could access it, they were just like, oh, thank God. And so even being deprived of the possibility for just a short period of time tended to generate this anxiety. And this is the, sort of the what, um, um, Orwell was on about in 1984. It's not simply that the distraction keeps you from thinking, although it does, and the constant interruptions keep you from thinking, it does. It generates a pattern of mind and of being in which you are used to being continually interrupted. And that if those continual interruptions do not happen, then you feel like you're missing something. Right? There's a void that's not being filled. And so you need that distraction. You need that continual distraction. You, you, you need to know it's there or else this anxiety starts to build up in you. And so this way, in, in Orwell's case, right? So, so you, then you would miss Big Brother, right? You would actively uh, be sorry that, that, they weren't, that, they, that, he, that he wasn't around, that he isn't just, what, why, why, what's gone wrong? that I'm not getting the updates from Big Brother, I'm not getting the messages, that I'm not getting the distractions. And you can see this model, and it's not just the smartphones, they're just a, sort of the ultimate, maybe I like to think, maybe they can't get worse than this, can it? Uh, uh, example of this, but you see this also in this training up of being in these sorts of rich, in, uh, sort of stimulus, distraction rich environments. If you go to a restaurant that have TVs in them, which I always find to be incredibly off-putting, but what happens is, so now you're in an environment where you have people, you have noise, you have smells and sounds, you have food, and into all of that, you add flashing TV images in the background. Usually they also have music on, so now you have music. And then you'll see people also take out their phones. And, I mean, talk about total mental saturation. It is, I, you know, I would say impossible, but it's virtually impossible to think a coherent thought when you're being inundated by this level of stimulation. And when you get used to it, what happens is, again, when you go to a place that's very quiet, there's maybe no music 
not a lot of people, there's no TVs, it's very calm, this feels boring and off-putting. The, the lack of stimulation makes you feel uncomfortable. And again, we're going to run an experiment on this. So again, I'll love to run all these experiments. And so this level of continual distraction is what has uh, sort of overtaken as a cultural norm. And so people now feel if they don't have that level of continual distraction, they, again, it feels wrong. It generates anxiety. It makes you feel uncomfortable. And you see this, this is the secret of Netflix, as I talked about last time, and the streaming services generally, by the way. Why would anyone go from a service that gave them the option to have 100,000 titles that they could choose from and that they got to select and have them delivered to their door so they could watch for a service that has 95% less titles much of them not not selected by them and so now they have to watch what somebody else has chosen why on earth would anybody do that ah the secret with the streaming service is it's instant it's now and so if i in the old system where they would order dvs dvds what you would do is you would place an order you could actually have a queue and when they sent you one, you watched it at your leisure, and then you sent it back, and when they got it back, they would send you another one, and they, so you'd have this rotation. And you could do different tiers, so you could maybe have five movies or three movies. Or, so, but, so you could have this continuous stream. You could be getting a movie a day or every other day or whatever. However, that turned out not to be instant enough. What we want, or what we've been trained, or what we've learned to want is something now. I want my stimulation now, which is not unnatural, but to the point where I would rather have something that I did not choose that I can watch now than something that I have selected that I have to wait for to watch tomorrow, or I might have to wait for an hour, or I might have watched it, and now I don't have something else waiting to watch. And so now I have to go, oh, let me put that away. And I always think back to um, the, when, when before recorded mu music existed, so let's go way back, sort of the opposite side of this. So concerts were this incredible, incredible event. We don't, we can't really get there from here, where you've gone for maybe a month or two, unless you're wealthy and have you know access to private salons where these musical performances are going on, which made also one of the attractions of these salons is you could hear live music. Maybe your friends have played. Maybe uh, your husband or wife plays the piano because a lot of people did. So you have some access to limited music, but certainly not a concert. Only the various wealthy people, uh, you know, like the um, the family that who was the family that kept Haydn about. Uh, you know, they had a lot of great music because they had Haydn on staff in their own orchestra. Um, so, but so now there's going to be a concert, and somehow you've saved up your money and you've bought a ticket. Now the music you're about to hear is probably the first and last time you will ever hear this music as a live concert because they're expensive they tend to be rare public performances only slowly uh, became a thing and so you're going to go in and be like okay i'm focused i'm in the mode i can't wait to hear this i am ready because i need to be here because i'm probably not going to be able to hear any live music and i certainly can't get a recording of it because those don't exist so Wow, what an incredibly intense experience. Well, it turns out, given our option, we would rather be able to go, oh, I want to listen to that right now, which is an amazing option. And so that desire to have that kind of stimulation continuously has been you know, tracked, studied, psychologists, all this, and Netflix and all the other streaming services have learned, oh, I just need to have a little bit because you are going to punch the button on something, whether you want to watch it or not, whether you just need to be slightly motivated to watch it or listen to it, or whatever. You don't need to be massively motivated. And so this is a completely different relationship to media. And it's driven by this notion of uh, sort of endless distraction media. And, and, and I see this again, talk to my students about it and watch people. One thing you'll see is often people will watch these streaming services, uh, particularly when they're at home, with their phones. 
So they'll be actually using their phones while they are quote unquote watching something on the streaming service, which means how good do they really need to be when you aren't, you're really only half watching it anyway, and then you're kind of half doing whatever it is you're doing on your phone, playing a game or communicating with your friends or doing something. And maybe you have a friend over, so you're sort of one third, one third, one third. And that model of uh, sort of how you interact with media is again, pretty new. It, you know, again, go back earlier, if you had a book, you probably only had one. They had lending libraries because books were so rare and then you read it. In fact, often people read books out loud because there weren't that many literate people and books were expensive and rare. And so books were generally, or not generally, but often read out loud in communal settings. So it's a very different environment for this. Uh, or, and, and also when you think about, say, reading a big novel or something, which used to be the sort of, you know, most popular media of, of a century or so ago, um, before the advent of, of film and, and radio sort of became the dominant mode. So, you know, you would sit by yourself and read, very involving, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of focus. Or you would, again, read in a group, in which case people are listening. It's a performative thing, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of focus. Fast forward to ours, which is sort of, you know, the sort of polar opposite, where we tend to want to have multiple stimulations going at one time because otherwise it's slightly, you know, off-putting again. And so this is what people actually comment on about why they like to go to the theater is because you're very inundated in a single media. Now, this might be a very loud, very flashy, very intense, obviously huge immersive experience. And it's like, oh, you know, I can't get that at home. And it's, it's true because, you know, you don't generally you don't have access to that kind of media. But part of the reason or the scale, but part of the reason is because you tend also to allow other distractions in and that notion of being continually distracted. In fact, I found in, in my classes, students would try and resist the notion that, oh, I, I, I need to take notes on my computer. I'm like, no, all the studies said this doesn't work, by the way. Um, but I just said, no, it's just too distracting. Same thing with phones. You have to put the phones away. And they're like, well, I'm not going to look at it. It's like, yeah, even they've done these studies with people driving in cars, even having the phone available is a distraction, right? Because your mind thinks about it. Again, you're, we're, you're trained up into it. If you've ever felt like your phone is buzzed and then checked it and realized that it didn't, that you didn't get a message, this is uh, not a mistake. This is not, uh, I mean, it is a mistake. You, you've, your, your phone has not given you a signal and you thought it had. But what happens is, again, your mind plays tricks on you and you've been so trained up to the stimulus that you start feeling it even when the stimulus isn't present, you know, sort of in the ultimate Pavlovian extension of uh, stimulus response, you can respond even without the actual stimulus, not, not because you're responding with the stimulus, but because you imagine that you've received the stimulus. And again, this notion of getting deep into your imagination. Now, none of this is revolutionary. We all understand this. We've all seen this. We all watch it take place. It influences us. I held out for the longest time. I didn't get a, a, a smartphone until about four years ago. I, I resisted. I didn't have any kind. I didn't have a cell phone of any kind until about four years ago and five years ago. And then maybe it's five years ago now. And I finally cracked. And they are incredibly powerful and useful tools. They're, they're like these miracles machines. I mean, they connect to satellites. They connect, I mean, think of all the stuff that that stupid little thing does. It, they are truly from the future. We're living in the future in so many ways. It's astounding. So I don't want to just rubbish uh, the, the technology because in, in so many ways it is astounding, but it's how the technology is used and how the technology has evolved to be used. And this is not a mistake. Again, this is not a um, incidental the notion of creating these highly stimulating, fast response, easy entry um, apps and stuff for everything is, you know, the model because the medium loves that and that generates a lot of response. I remember I had an, I, I actually purchased an app and I paid $20 for it and it was this amazing jazz app called iReal Pros or something. Anyway, it has all kinds of jazz scores in it and it will play you um, sort of versions of your practicing piano or an instrument that you can play along with these classic jazz scores. I mean, it has thousands of jazz scores in there, classics of all kinds. And you can sort of 
try different kinds of chord changes and you can change the key. And this is a great, I, I thought it was, it's just amazing. Like one of these things that you look and go, wow, that really is an amazing app. I love this. This is the power of the device. Very helpful in many ways. My students thought that I had lost my mind. The notion of paying and certainly $20 for an app, you would have thought I had, I had, I don't know. I think it's just they thought I just got suckered completely. Like, why would you ever pay? Like this notion of free, right? Again, like commercial TV. Once we get used that things like Instagram or Facebook or uh, games should be free and apps should be free, now we're in this strange world where we go, oh, it should be free. Therefore, who's paying for it? And again, if you're not paying for it, the classic phrase is, you're the product, you're being sold. So you can either pay and use an app however you want, or you can be the product and be sold. And then the product is designed to package you for resale. This is the key. Uh, and will exploit you in any way it can because you're the product, you're basically the mind. And so if you think of coal mining, like one of these horrible processes where they have this type of coal mining called mountaintop removal, which as the name suggests is where they just rip the mountain open and then dig all the coal out. So it's an environmental catastrophe in so many ways. This is, you are a resource exactly like a coal mine. And if they have to rip your mountaintop off to dig out all the shit out of you that they need, which is your attention and your money, they'll do it. This is not, they're not concerned with your psychological, emotional, personal well being. And uh, this leads to all kinds of ramifications, but I want to give a, a contrast so you can see the distinction between what's possible, where we've been. Uh, and, and where we are and what develops. Because it's not just that this influenced culture, which of course popular culture, the name of the series, but it, it, it um, sort of shapes how we interact with, how we understand ourselves, as I mentioned before. As I said with TV, when the world keeps getting cut up on TV into smaller and smaller slices, we feel like the world is the kind of place that can be understood in a minute or in a two minute. And so if somebody says, wants to talk about something for an hour or two hours, or the book is 800 pages long because it's a complex su subject with a lot of history, that's just too much. It's too much nuance. It's too much depth. We, we can, actually can't take it in. And so we want a one minute response to a one minute world, right? Like the, um, it, it, whatever it is, think of any, any issue and somebody would go, oh, you know, we have global warming. Oh, stop oil. Stop using oil and we won't have global warming, which it's wrong in every way. But what it highlights is this notion of, of as, a, as a politician, as an environmentalist, as a whatever, if you're for it or against it, it doesn't matter. But both our attacks on and our responses to tend to be lack nuance, lack detail, because we just get bored. We can't listen to that. We can't hear a long discussion. We can't hear nuanced positions. And people go, oh, wow, society is very polarized, and but it is in some ways. But part of that is simply, if you don't have time, if you don't have attention, if you don't have a medium that will give you a 20-minute discussion of a subject, then how are you supposed to have a non-polarized position? You basically can say, these are the good people, those are the bad people, and, and you're done. Right, like there's this. This is you can't really. Like, what else can you do in a minute? All you can do is identify the good people and the bad people, and and then curse the bad people and praise the good people, and done. In end of debate. So polarized, right? Of course, this is very polarizing. If that's all your media can do, and literally when it's only a minute or two or three minutes long, and you're talking about subjects like global warming or poverty or environmental degradation or uh, education, yeah, you. You're sort of that, that the medium does not allow you to do anything uh, beyond that. Even more so, accelerate that when you have this sort of social media thing where you get these uh, continuous feedback loops, this uh, desire for presentation. So, if I want to feel good about myself by having positive feedback from a medium that is this continual. Uh, interruption machine that wants you know flash one image okay my friends like that image great that's good flash another image my friends like that and again Instagram was a great idea right I want to see pictures of my friends and what they're doing so here we go that's nice and it turns out people really like that and this is perfectly like no criticism of this like Instagram is great 
Well, it turns out that that wasn't maximally profitable. And so Instagram has, it wanted to be like TikTok, and so they don't care what you want. And so they adopted all these strategies that people actively dislike, the users actively dislike, but it doesn't matter because Instagram is not yours. Um, Facebook is not yours. All these sorts of things are not yours. And the way you know this, and this is one that kind of drives me mad, and we'll just use Instagram as an example, is Instagram, like I mentioned on Netflix last time, controls who you see, when you see them, and, and how it's organized. And it actually changes over time, and they change your feed. So if you try to scroll through your feed and find something that you had seen before, it may not be there anymore. Like your history is not, not stored in any sort of coherent manner. And again, what you're presented is not necessarily presented by what you want to see or by the people you follow. It's presented by what maximally benefits uh, Facebook, a meta they call themselves now, Facebook, um, because that's the goal. And uh, just using 1984 as our sort of continual... Uh, source here, one of the things that Orwell talks about there and a lot of other people have talked about is when you have no coherent history, then you have no way of tracking the past. And what happens with these sorts of apps like Facebook and Instagram and other social media apps is, is and like I mentioned, even something at the edge like Netflix that reorders the things that you put up there, is you have no sense of the past. Because the pictures you've posted and the po pictures your friends have posted are not going to be there in the order in which they were posted. And they're hard to access anyway. Because Instagram doesn't want you scrolling through the past. They want you paying attention to the present. And also they have the ability to change the look, change the layout, change all this. So, and this is specifically what, uh, you know, uh, disrupts your sense of place, disrupts your sense of history, disrupts your sense of the present. You're constantly being interrupted. You go to look for something in the past. It's not there. Now you have to ask yourself, was it really there? Or maybe I'm just imagining it, but I'm pretty sure it was there. Did that really happen? And it, this seems trivial, but it also is a bit maddening because this is how we build a coherent understanding of the world, right? If we came into our rooms every day, um, if we're living someplace and it was rearranged and the stuff was changed uh, subtly or in a major way, this will drive you crazy because you're like, wait, was somebody in here? No, I expect my things to be where they were, where I left them. I expect the, the, the things that identify as my history to be there. And there's so many films and books and stories and whatnot where people start to doubt their past, right? They start to get evidence that they've misunderstood their past or that things aren't going along that's feel, and it kind of drives them crazy. Well, congratulations, right? We've, we've imported this as a form and we call it social media. The past is either completely erased or it's not in our control. We can't organize it. And even the look and feel of the present is subject to change without our being asked or having anything to do with it. And being in that constant state of flux outside of our control is very weird. We like stable environments. We like novelty too. This is one of the tensions of being human, but we like stable environment. And when you spend a lot of time in a quote unquote digital environment, if you will, the notion that this is arbitrarily reorganized without our consent it, well, you do consent to it, by the way, when you sign the little, do you agree to all this crap? So theoretically with your consent, but not really with your consent. They just change the layout. They change how things look. They change how it works. They change what's stored in your account. All this stuff just changes, right? With, with no, and it's weird and we kind of shrug it off, but it is quite maddening. And it is one of the elements that Orwell specifically cites as how Big Brother throws you off all the time. This is how they make it so you can't think, so you can't have a strong sense of yourself. You can't have a strong sense of imagination um, you, and, 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 and reason and introspection and self-presentation. Uh, All these things suffer when you're constantly being distracted and put in these environments where they're pretty much uh, paranoia generation machines in a, in a way that really undermine your sense of yourself. So what Orwell got wrong and what I think is fascinating is 
a couple of things, but one of them is he thought this would have to be imposed with force and with you know massive social and, and military and physical coercion. But it turns out that we'll pay money for, in fact, we'll fight you to the death for our phones. No, this is not just voluntary, but we subscribe to services that do this to us. Uh, we pay for our phones, which are not cheap. Uh, we take them with us everywhere, and, and we, we desperately don't want to lose them. And so, is that better or worse, right? Like, Chris, at least in, in, in 1984, you had some sense that, wow, there's something to fight against. But here it's like, oh, we love this. We love this. And this makes me think of a, a very much less good book, by the way, but still sort of interesting, which is Fahrenheit 451. 451? Is that the right? Is temperature? Anyway, Fahrenheit 400, blah, blah. Um, but the point he makes in there that is often missed is it is a sort of a story about censorship, but what he really does is talk about the notion of having created a world in which people no longer want to read. Like reading is no longer something that is done. They don't understand it. They don't want to do it. It's not doable because it's not interesting. It's not entertaining. It's not immediately available. It doesn't appeal enough. And that is the ultimate form of censorship. The ultimate form of censorship, uh, as far as uh, Bradbury, Bradbury, yes, was concerned, was the creation of a population that no longer had the capacity or habit or sense that reading was something that could or should be done. And that normalization of infinite distraction and infinite bothersome and inability to reflect or in, uh, lack of a desire to be in an environment where you might be able to read or you might be able to have self-reflection or you might be able to have a strong sense of an inner world is really the form of contemporary media reaching its, like I said, apex or nadir, depending on how you want to think about it, with social media uh, and streaming services in this continuous 24-hour-a-day poke, 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 poke. That is really where I think the the most interesting, dynamic, and perhaps terrifying element of this comes to the fore. And it's it's the notion of what does this do to people as individuals and culturally. And so a contrast here is to just let's go back in time. Um, let's go back to the Renaissance. And I always think of the Renaissance, if you read something like Castiglione's The Courtier, quite famous, or the letters from the time, uh, of course, you look at the ridiculous collection of, you know, masterworks that were produced <clears throat> and you go, wow, all right, this is, yeah, impressive folks doing impressive work. But I, what, what we miss, I think, or at least what fascinates me is this idea of what were they shooting for? Like, what was their culture trying to produce? And I always think that, the, the, to summarize, and this is my own sort of unique take maybe, is that... Uh, in the Renaissance, you were supposed to get up in the morning, assuming you weren't a peasant or a slave or, you know, sort of the, the, the people that mattered, right? And you had all the social distinction issues and all that, so I don't want to overgloss this. But for the people who were the courtiers, for the people who were um, the, the artists and the, the people who were trying to achieve, it seems like they got up in the morning and they said, all right, how can I be fabulous today, right? Like, I want to be a super fabulous person. And it seems like well, their theory of producing fabulous art and architecture and all of these amazing things, and they had generals and literature and poets. Uh, we forget that Michelangelo was known as a poet as well uh, at, at his time. And, and what we forget is that the, the environment that produced all this was actually quite different and new. Again, it was a rediscovery of the classics and the, ability, and the desire, however imperfectly understood, to mimic what the ancient world had done. Because they thought that, man, if we can make ourselves as individuals great, like the ancient world was great, well, then we'll do great things. So you don't worry so much about the external things, or you worry about them, but you also worry about making yourself great. If you can make yourself great and powerful and wonderful, um, then what you do will be great and powerful and wonderful. And they had this idea, sort of classic from the, from the Renaissance era, of, of how you train or learn something, particularly for the arts, but this was 
a general concept that was kind of articulated as a three-step uh, process, which was studere, maimise, and imitato, uh, which is study. And what they mean specifically by study was look to um, the great works, right? Do not spend your time with things that aren't great. And, and study them closely. See what techniques they had. See what principles they used to create a, a great work of art, a great, great architecture, great literature, a great speech. How did they speak? Like really study it and tear it down and look at the, 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 the most basic elements so that you really have that. So take a single speech by Cicero or a single great sculpture that were being unearthed or look at some pieces of architecture that have survived and go, you know, let's take this apart. And then mimesis, which is to say, uh, and this had to do with both nature and these great works. Now, uh, take these classic works and see, copy some of the elements, copy the details, copy. So if they're using uh, some sort of uh, archway, see, let's, let's make an archway like that. See how it's made and then copy that archway. Mimesis just means to copy or to mimic. Um, it, see how nature does it and see if you can copy these elements from nature and, and, and reproduce them. And then finally, once you've studied and once you've copied, uh, now they have this thing called imitate, which sounds like the same thing as copy, but what it really means is now produce your own. Uh, look to one of these great things and make one of them. Do it, make it your own version, because you know how they did it because you, you've been studying it and you've been copying the details and the elements and now make your own and make it great. So look to how painters maybe from a previous generation or sculptors from the classic world or architects or writers. And again, very simple. Take whatever you really like, tear it apart, see how it's done, study it in detail. Look at the different elements, see if you can copy the different elements and then see if you can put it all together and make a work like that that is your own, an imitation of the work. So for instance, like let's say you're, uh, you're into music and you go, okay, great, I want to do a symphony like Mahler for some reason, for God's sakes. Uh, probably start a little smaller, I would say, but why not, let's go with Mahler. You know, take what, the Mahler symphony you like, tear it all apart, look at you know every dynamic, every element that you can, and then uh, look at different sections and see how you can figure it out. And then go, okay, this was a, whatever, 40 minute, four minute symphony in this key that had some of these themes. Now I'm gonna write my own 40 minute symphony in, with these key, with these themes. And I'm gonna just kind of do my own version of that. And then you'll just learn so much, right? This will just give you this incredible rich grasp on the elements that go into involved in everything around that. And because it's a great work, the idea was that you would be imbibing uh, all the elements that are necessary to produce more great works. Now, why do I go on at length about this? Studere Maimise and Imitato. Well, it creates a particular kind of individual because what all of that takes is a lot of time. You may have noticed this. So when I was in college, we would take these what were called survey courses. I tried to take as little, as, as little, as few of these as possible because I hated survey courses. Because it'd be like, okay, we're going to read, you know, I don't know, 27 American novels in whatever, 16 weeks. And so you're just burning through these novels. Oh, God, I just, did, I just dislike this immensely because you're just you know, you're going too fast. It's like, to me, this is what I felt, was like, you're, you're reading, okay, you got you get some idea of the plot, okay, now I gotta read the next one, now I gotta read the next one, now I gotta read the next one. Um, the better, what I liked were, were, were the uh, courses where you say, okay, we're gonna take one or two or three novels or maybe four novels and have a theme and we're gonna really look at them, we're gonna tear them apart, see how they're put together, how do they relate to this philosophical idea or to this period, why do they influence other things? And in, in France, well, I talked to one of my friends who was educated in France, and she said that they would do one novel for a year. So we'd do a year on one novel. And, you know, so you're talking about the biography, the author, the history of the time. So all this other stuff is getting wrapped up in this one novel. And so this notion of going very slowly, very detailed, very technical, and very rich means that you're making something that is yours. 
if you spend this kind of time with with a with a with a book or with a piece of music or with a painting or with or with whatever interests you and you you know study it try to copy it a little bit maybe produce an imitation of it it's inside of you you've made it yours it, it enriches your inner life um, and if you do this repeatedly um, studying reading carefully reflecting discussing then it becomes increasingly rich to you and i talked about this in another series where i went for a period of time where i would only listen to uh, beethoven symphonies i listened to them in order once one a week i listened to no other music and i when i listened to it i had to listen through completely and, and then listen to it and then i could listen to it again and take notes and then I would read, uh, Hector Berlioz had a study of each of the symphonies. And what happened over the course of nine weeks is, I mean, you just revolution my sense of Beethoven's music and understanding and appreciation of them and his development as a thinker and really increase the depth of my appreciation for music of that era, what had come before, how this evolved into the next generation of Brahms and Mahler and uh, so on, and why Debussy is so revolutionary, and you know all of these elements. Ferranc, uh, she's a female composer. Uh, how she related to all this. Um, Louise Ferranc. She was at the Paris Conservatory early on, and you just—it's just wow! It, it, this incredible influence. It was so rich, but the richness came not from having a lot, and not from having a lot of stimulation, but by reducing the stimulation and by focusing. And this is what I think is uh, sort of at stake here and what influences. You slowly erode your capacity for introspection when you lose the ability to basically to sit quietly and introspect, right? If you can't sit quietly for 40 minutes and sort of ponder, you're in trouble. Uh, and when I would run these experiments with my class, it really did trouble them, as, as we're going to articulate here in just a second. It really did trouble them. They th This capacity... Uh, is, is slipping away. Now, whether it was broadly held in the culture, you used to not have a choice, right? You, you were going to spend a lot of quiet time because um, you're either going to be with people, but you're just walking places because you had to walk um, before the advent of all this media. And so slowly, that sense has been eroded. And now it's to the point where it almost feels unnatural. But we do know, psych psychological studies are, are as clear as psychological studies ever are, but it's the track record seems pretty solid here, is continual distraction, last, lack of introspection, lack of quiet, um, and lack of a, a sense of personal interiority does cause uh, high levels of anxiety in people. Uh, and so what happens is to deal with the anxiety, you seek more stimulation which distracts you from the anxiety, but then creates this feedback of generating yet more anxiety. And that cycle, I think, as you can see reflected in many ways in our culture, and so I don't, you know, I don't want to go into too much, but you can look at the psychological research on this, it's, it's pretty clear. So um, this is the arc that we've been on, going from film uh, to to TV, now to, to social media, and like I think I like to think we've reached maximum uh, interactive uh, interruption, but perhaps not. And it's not that any of these are bad or any of them are, are evil in and of themselves. Technology is just technology. Always remember this: a shovel can, uh, you know, dig a dig an irrigation ditch that's going to grow food, or you can hit somebody with it and kill them. Right? This is not the shovel's fault. But the same thing with this technology. Is, has all kinds of good applications and it's beautiful art forms and so much richness has come from it, but it's not being deployed in a neutral way. The, the magic driver of popular culture says that if it's going to be paid for and it's going to generate the incredible wealth that has been pouring out of these companies and has just transformed our technology and social media and media landscapes, it's because they're being used and deployed in very specific ways that are often quite insidious to our mental uh, well-being. And certainly, at, even if you want to think of it as neutrally, takes no interest in our well-being whatsoever. It's, it's to maximize their profit, not to make you feel good or give you something that has high utility value that enriches the quality of your life. That's always important to remember. So experiment for you. And this is the, the last experiment before the conclusion of the series. 
And this one, it's going to be rough, but I do, it, it, to the extent that you can, the, the, the more you try this, uh, the more learning you will achieve. It's sort of just this kind of thing. The, the, the harder you try, the more aggressive you are, uh, the, the better the feedback to get of, of what's going on in our world. And I used to do this in college. It was one of my favorite experiments every year. Everybody looked forward to it because it's so much fun. And I call it Media Free Week. And so what I would like you to do is try to um, take a week, set a week aside, maybe next week starting today or whenever is convenient for you, and try and go as media free as possible. And what I like to articulate this as is imagine you're Amish. So you get no music, no recorded music. You can play live music, that's up to you. No recorded music, uh, No, don't use your phone, don't use your computer, um, none of that. Don't listen to the radio in your car, probably gonna have to drive your car around, but don't, don't listen to your radio in your car. And, and as much as possible, try to liberate yourself from the influence of media and encounters with it. Now, this will be extraordinarily difficult. I understand this, but that's part of the assignment. So let's say for work, for instance, you need to use your computer. Great. So, and, and take note of all this, by the way. This is, the, this is where the learning comes. This is to take notes as you go along in the kinds of things that you encounter. And, and so you say, all right, I've got to use my computer for work, but one, only use it as much as you have to, and two, when you don't have to use it, either turn the computer off or you know put it in the background, but also turn off anything that is not specifically work-related that is on your computer for the duration of the week. So often I see people at work and they'll have like a text window from their uh, husband or their wife and they'll have um, you know, maybe a podcast going in the background, says the guy who's making YouTube videos that people listen to at work, uh, you know, and then they'll have maybe whatever, whatever they're working on that's actually part of their work, and then they'll have updates from whatever baseball team they like, right? And so when I see their computer screens, I see a little bit of work, or maybe a lot of work, but I also see a lot of other things. So see if you can turn off all those distractions. And then, as much as possible, don't use the computer. See how much work you can do actually without the computer being on. And again, try and track this, keep track of this. And then outside the work environment, now notice this is your free time. So outside of your work environment, you should be able in theory to really control the amount of media and the amount of time you have this. So maybe just turn your phone off for a week, right? Um, just shut it off. Just you know, plug it into the charger and power it down and say, I'll get back to you in a week and see what happens. Uh, so yeah, this is a difficult experiment, I know. Another thing you can do is turn off the ringer and the buzzer on your phone. So in case you absolutely have to use it for something, right? Um, it's your choice, right? The phone is not giving you any feedback. You only go, oh, I have to find directions to this or I have to show my, you know, barcode that they sent me so that I can get into a venue or I can get my flight or something. I, you know, you whatever works, make make it work. But then keep track of that, and then also keep track of all the time that you can't help yourself. Like you might say, oh, I want to go shopping. Okay, I'll go shopping. You go to the grocery store, and all of a sudden, of course, what do you see? Advertising, and you hear that horrible, horrible grocery store music, which really really that's a crime right so okay i gotta get groceries fine like you know but but you know make note of that like oh yeah okay there it was um maybe your friends say hey we want to go see a movie okay we'll say well i can't go see a movie because you know I'm, I'm on this media free week experiment because i'm this weirdo right um any case run this experiment and see see how people respond to you see how you feel about time see how you feel about your interaction with the world see where it was really impossible to avoid and, and, you know, where was it just habitual and didn't really need to be there? And then you'll get a sense of, we talk about being free people in a free world and we can do what we want, but wow, the social pressures and the kinds of social forms that really push us and encourage us and draw us and expectations of other people drive us to behave in certain ways and to relate to media and technology in certain ways are real things. These are really powerful. 
And so hopefully this experiment will give you the opportunity to get a very strong sense of that. So give it a try, media free week, see if you can do it. I wish you the best of luck. See if your friends will help you out in making this happen uh, and see how you can use your time without involving uh, media or technology. Thank you very much.